<clears throat> I won't move the microphones this time. <laughs> they get up in my in my line of sight. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. We'll get started because we, uh, we want to make the most of the time that we have with Michelle today. So welcome. Uh, for anybody in the room that hasn't met me before, I'm Catherine Anderson. I'm the Deputy Director at the New Venture Institute at Flinders. And if this is your first time at Tonsley, welcome to Tonsley. Uh, for those who are joining us on an ongoing basis, good to see you again. Uh, we, we run, NVI runs a Feed Your Brain session every Friday at lunchtime and uh, because we have Michelle Bowen with us today, we, uh, we're running an extra, extra session. So thanks for being here with us. I'm not going to, to do uh, too much of an introduction because you all know why you're here, but uh, suffice it to say, Michelle Bowen is a world leading theorist in the emerging field of peer-to-peer -peer theory and in the economy of peer production. So peer production looks uh, at an alternative to uh, an economy based on capitalism. Uh, it's based on interdependence and, uh, and networking, which of course is a founding principle upon which Tonsley is built and we're certainly hoping to, uh, to make good that aspiration uh, here at Tonsley. Michelle is the founder of the P2P Foundation and the author of The Political Economy of Peer Production. That's enough from me. We're going to have about 25 minutes of uh, Michelle giving you a bit of a, a, an overview and, and in, inspiring us all with a few thoughts uh, from, from him. We'll have some question time after that. Our formal session is around about half an hour, so if you are booked in for a half hour and you need to go, then that, that's fine. We won't mind you quietly scooting out the back. But if you are able to stay, I think we've got a few more minutes of Michelle's time before we need to pop him in a car back into the city. Uh, so uh, if you've got some questions, uh, please make sure that we've got a great discussion afterwards. Uh, enough from me. Over to Michelle. Um, hello. So I'm, I heard it was kind of a startup uh, culture here. Uh, and just for my own credentials then, uh, I, I had two startups in the late 1990s. One was doing extranets and intranets, which was sold to Alcatel. And another one was doing uh, interactive cyber marketing, but ethical marketing, which was a company based on actually negotiating with moderators of uh, virtual communities uh, about you know, how, what they found acceptable in terms of communication. And, and that was sold to a Belgian holding company. Um, but I kind of got gradually dis disenchanted with the startup model as it exists today. And this morning I was talking to people from the cooperatives here in South Australia, um, because I think there is a big disconnect between cooperative models and, and technology. Even though this thing that you can read, the French study shows that if you choose a cooperative model for your startup, you have about nine times, nine times as much chance to survive than if you don't do it. So startup models with venture capital are based basically winner-take-all models, right? If you're the, the first in the race, you're very, very happy, but you probably won't, will not be. And so you're part of these 98% who are working just as hard, uh, but not getting anything in return. Um, so is there any other way to to think about you know, doing businesses today, um, and I think there is one. So basically, you probably know what peer production is, so I'll just kind of define it. So today we have more and more open contributory systems, like the Wikipedia, like Linux, like Arduino, like Wikispeed, like Wikihouse. So we have global open design communities around which are built entrepreneurial coalitions. Um, and usually also they have these associations like Wikimedia Foundation, Arduino Foundation, and Spiral Foundation, which are the associations that manage the infrastructure of cooperation. So this is kind of the new model I'm talking about. Um, as you may know, the Fair Use Economy Report in the US has calculated that the value of the economy around shared resources is now one-sixth of GDP and employs 70 million people. Uh, 
However, I think there is a bit of a problem between the optimal relation between these new productive communities that are consisting of contributors, paid or unpaid, to what I call a commons, a commons of knowledge, a commons of code, or a commons of design, and the entrepreneurial forms that uh, are created around these commons. So this is the kind of thing that we are busy with. So uh, if you like what the P2P Foundation does, and I consider myself a civic entrepreneur uh, in a way, is we are an observator of that space between the commons and the market. So we look at all that is happening in the interface between deciding to create an economy not around privatized knowledge but, but around shared knowledge, right? And so you have these companies becoming codependent on a shared resource. Think about IBM and its relation to Linux. So the concern today, I think, is one of uh, systems of entrepreneurship that capture too much value from human cooperation without reinvesting in these shared resources. Now, an extreme example, of course, would be Facebook. Uh, as much as we like or dislike Facebook, uh, the business model of Facebook is entirely dependent on our participation on that platform. So there would be no value whatsoever in the platform without us. Yet the exchange mechanism, the value uh, mechanism of Facebook, does not reinvest anything in this co-creation of value, right? It, it's all the money goes to the shareholders, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, in other words, it's a bit of an extreme example, but we can see this uh, many times around peer production: is that there is an insufficient return to the communities that create the value in the first place. Um, you may also know that the fastest growing sociological group in our societies are independent entrepreneurs. In the Netherlands, one quarter of the population going to one third. But they're also the fastest impoverishing group in our societies. So being an entrepreneur is great, um, but at the same time, it's very difficult. And lots of us are actually precarious. Uh, and Okay, so here's the problem as I describe it. Can we move from a situation where most of these shared resources, most of the value of these shared resources is captured by extractive business models that do not reinvent, reinvest sufficiently in the co-creation of value to generative business models that create livelihoods for the contributors of these systems um, and actually reinvest in the in in the people who are doing the value creation right so this is kind of the the question so a really nice example of whoops what happened here um, yeah. <laughs> so should I maybe click here no um, hey, here, oh, 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 oh. there we go, yeah, um, I didn't touch it. <laughs> um, yes, so that's in Spiral, I don't know if you know them, they're from the island next door, New Zealand, and they're kind of typical of the kind of thing I'm looking for, so I'm quite enthusiastic about how they, how they see what they do. Um, so just to repeat how this new economy looks like. So at the heart of value creation, we have shared resources. Code, com code design, etc. Around these shared resources, we have entrepreneurial coalitions that create added value for the market based on this codependency on this shared resource. And then we have these four benefit associations which do not command the production within these open contributor systems, but make it possible. So they enable and empower the cooperation to occur over time. So think about the role of the Wikimedia Foundation, which f raises funds for the service of the Wikipedia so that the system can continue to operate. Uh, think about the Linux Foundation, which protects the license, the GPL license, which regulates the conflicts between the companies and the community or between the companies that work around Linux. So 
this is basically also how Inspiral works. So the core of Inspiral are its shared resources. So actually, Inspiral was created at Occupy Wellington. Uh, so people were, at the same time, enthusiastic about what they discovered, but also uh, concerned about the difficulties of cooperation and decision making uh, in these democratic spaces. So kind of their idea was, can, is there a place between a hierarchy and the blob? Right? So that, that was their kind of motivation to create Inspiral. And they also were very strong on an, uh, an ethic of mutual aid. Um, okay. So the commons of Inspiral is uh, an open source program called Lumio, which is an open source decision making platform that we use at the P2P Foundation. It's ideal for virtual communities where people don't work together in the same physical space, where you have to take decisions. And so Lumio allows you to, to legitimately take decisions collectively uh, with a whole series of decision-making protocols that you can choose from. Uh, they also have something called co-budgeting. Uh, I think it says here 20% of their invoices go to the collective bucket. Uh, and so they have this piece of software called co-budgeting, which allows them to reinvest in other ventures in the network. Okay? So these are the shared resources that Inspiral is co-developing as a community. The second level is 18 different business ventures, and they're social entrepreneurial business ventures. So the, the tagline of, of Inspiral is doing stuff that matters. So it's, it's oriented towards solving ecological and social issues. So each of these business ventures is not necessarily non-profit non or not-for-profit. Some of them are for-profit, but they're all mission-oriented, purpose-driven. Uh, then they have uh, something called Inspiral Services, which is also a business arm. It's basically a contracting arm. They do development for Silicon Valley companies, etc., etc. So this is the ethical entrepreneurial coalition that functions around their commons. So all these entrepreneurs helping each other out in a collaborative culture uh, to develop their own business models. And the third aspect of uh, Inspiral is the Inspiral Foundation, which is uh, basically their for benefit association. Does that make sense? So. So in, in a way, Inspiral is a pretty good example of how it could look like. So basically, this is how it looks like today, right? The problem is that you have a, a productive community, but you have business models that extract too much value from the, the common work without reinvesting it sufficiently. So I, I call this exclusionary financialization to a kind of a social model that looks I hope I have it here. Yep, it's a bit small, but I think you can still see it. To a, a kind of a model, which is also a model for society, in which every citizen has the capacity to contribute to the collective building of shared resources, in which you have an economy that turns around these commons, that creates livelihoods for the contributors, for the commoners, if you like, um, and develops ethical forms of business, generative forms of business. And then you have, at the macro level, you would have forms of state, forms of city, which we call partner city, partner state, which is at the territorial level, at the territorial level, the kind of equivalent of the four benefit association. So the role of the government in this scenario is to enable and empower you know, entrepreneurial activity around shared resources and, and common good resources. Um, now, just to go back to, the, to this uh, connection here between the commons and the market. So what we do in the P2P Foundation, let me just quickly show that, is Basically, we are an observatory of these practices. So we have 20,000 articles, 30 million views of everything that's connected to this emergence. Uh, so if you see here the peer-driven collaborative and ethical economy, 
So we look at collaborative economic practices, for example, open business models. What is an open business model? It's a business model that is based on sharing resources. So if you're a musician, you know that your music will be shared. And you know that the, the more they share, the more they buy your music. So you're not going to fight against your fans. You're going to develop added value business models that are based on the reality of today's technology, which is that people share. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, this works. This is not uh, science fiction. There's uh, the whole free software economy is based on this. Then we look at open company formats. There's today a wide variety of non-extractive business models you can choose from. Cooperatives, the solidarity economy, social entrepreneurship, fair trade models, right? There's a wide variety of things you can do outside of the classic startup model. Mutualizing infrastructures. If you work in a co-working center, a fab lab, a maker space, you can dramatically reduce your footprint and cost structure, right? Uh, and you can actually create a collaborative culture because all these people are working in, in the same space. You can mutualize your accounting. You can mutualize many, many, many different services that you could not afford or would make it very difficult for you as an entrepreneur to do on an individual basis. Um, you can crowdfund, right? Today, there's all kinds of ways to fund yourself without being necessarily dependent on a bank. My favorite is called Goteo, goteo.org. It's a commons-oriented crowdfunding platform, which you can only use if you create commons. So that's the condition to use that uh, crowdfunding uh, panel. But they then help you to develop a community-centric funding strategy. So it's not just a reverse market like uh, Kickstarter. It actually creates community around your entrepreneurial ventures, your open entrepreneurial ventures. Uh, and then we go to P2P value and open accounting. Let me just quickly go to that and show you uh, what this is about. So how, how capitalism in many ways, as you probably know, is a, it's a lot about rent extraction, right? So let's take urbanism. So you have a poor neighborhood and very low rent. So a lot of young people, lots of artists, go to this uh, low-rent neighborhood and they start doing enormously nice stuff performances music well before you know it the yuppies want to be there too right so you get gentrification real estate goes up and the people who actually created the value are kicked out of the neighborhood this is typical right and this is a rent extraction mechanism right they didn't create the value. They're speculating on the value that was created by other people. And um, think about Bitcoin. works the same way. Bitcoin is a democratization of rent extraction. It's designed so that it's very cheap to produce at the beginning. It gets more and more expensive to produce. It's designed so that the demand for it is, grows faster than the supply, which means that the people at the beginning can sell the money for a higher price, making money with money. They haven't produced anything. Uh, so typically, this is peer-to-peer -peer rent extraction, right? Um, um, so this is also a big problem for the commons, even if you mean well. So I'll give you an example very close to us. So we work with a translators collective called Guerrilla Translation. And half of their work is translating for free text about the commons from English to French, uh, Spanish and Spanish to English. By doing this, they create collective reputational value, social capital. So it means that at some point in time, some publisher will say, and this happens, can you translate this book about the commons? And then two or three people, however well-meaning they are, will capture the value that has been co-created by 10 or 20 people. Does that make sense? Right? So this is a, a key issue in the commons economy is something we have to deal with. So the answer to this may be, and I think in large degree it will be, is something we call contributory accounting. 
So in the case of Guerrilla Translation, it's very easy. It's just translating. You count the characters of all the free translations. And the people who get market contracts give 15% of their income to the contributory accounting system, right? Just as the people in Inspire will give part of their income to the collective bucket. This is a recognition that the value created was dependent on something collective. And that as an ethical person, an ethical entrepreneur, you want to acknowledge this dependency on the common resource and you want to fund it. So this is what we call a generative business model. And this is one of the examples is open value counting. Um, let me just show you if you think this is kind of a hippie thing. Uh, we have how much? 387 concept practices just on that topic, right? Um, so, before I, I finish, I, because I was told to be short, uh, here's a, a very important potential of this new model. If you design for a company, you design for scarcity. If you design for the market, you have to maintain scarcity. So if you design a green computer, it will still break down in two and a half years, right? Planned obsolescence is not a bug, it's a feature. If you design in an open design community, you have no incentive to design unsustainable pro products and services. So Wikispeed, open source car, is five times as fuel efficient as any commercial car on the market. Wikihouse, a open platform for sustainable living and housing, creates carbon positive houses, not just carbon neutral, but carbon positive houses. And so this is the first aspect, right? Is designing an open design community with a commons guarantees sustainable design. Producing it as an ethical entrepreneurial coalition creates generative business models around these sustainable products and services. Mutualizing infrastructures through the sharing economy, bike sharing, car sharing, um, can dramatically reduce the footprint of any activity. So in cars, it's about 12 to 24 times. So any shared car can replace 12 to 24 private cars, depending on the, um, on the calculations. The, you know that the average drill is used eight minutes in a lifetime. So if you have a neighborhood system for sharing tools in your neighborhood, you can dramatically reduce the cost of your infrastructure and still do whatever it is you want to do using these resources that you share in your neighborhood. The third thing is even more important, and it's the rule that if we apply this system, we can very much apply a very simple rule, which is if it's light, it's global, and if it's lo heavy, it's local. So combining global open design with distributed manufacturing on demand in micro factories has an enormous potential to reduce by two thirds the thermodynamic efficiency of our production systems. If you look at matter and energy flows today, not money, because the financial system hides the externalities. If you look at matter and energy flows, and there are systems in the world that do this today, like I lived in Ecuador for six months, and there was a very sophisticated project to do this. Two thirds today of production costs are transportation. So having an industrial policy based on distributed manufacturing global knowledge streams, but actually producing locally close to the area of demand can dramatically reduce the cost in matter and energy of our current production system. Um, and again, this would depend on the right connection between a global community of engineers, Wikihouse, Wikispeed, with entrepreneurial vehicles that can use that knowledge, produce it locally, but have a generative relationship with these commons, right? Um, yeah, I didn't have much time, so I hope it just gives you a flavor of what is happening and what can potentially happen. Uh, of course, this is emergent. The extractive models are dominant for the moment. 
but I would say that this is very dangerous for our society. Because what we are doing with these extractive models like Uber and Airbnb is creating generalized precarity. And if we don't want generalized precarity, it's really urgent that we start thinking about generative business models that learn to work with these commons, these open productive communities. And I would argue, and this is my conclusion, we need to find post-corporate forms, uh, post-extractive forms of creating livelihoods around these open contributory systems. But they are inevitable because in any industrial sector where some entrepreneurs decide to do this, they can so dramatically reduce the cost of their operations that they become very competitive against legacy systems, right? Which is why the Wikipedia has replaced the Britannica, which is, my, which is why Microsoft cannot sell its software anymore, etc., etc. So that's the point I want to make. Thank you so much. And we have time for discussion, right? Excuse me. We do. We have uh, we have a number of minutes of time for for discussion. So, hopefully, there's some great questions. Just a, a quick note on the. You've all got a microphone on on the table in front of you. To the left of the microphone is a small button. If you toggle that on, that turns your microphone on. When you toggle that off, it turns it off again. So we'll use that to uh, to get your your questions to the front. And Michelle, you're welcome to sit or stand. Either way. Yeah, I'll sit. You'll sit. It's a long day. We have some questions from the floor. It's a lot to take in, isn't it? Yes. Hi. Um, just a question to ask you whether, you know, ones like Google, ones like AC, would they be extracting? Are they not helping to build uh, infrastructure uh, for computerizing? Yes, they, they are, and this is a paradox. And um, now, of course, you don't have to agree with me, but you know, if I look at history, right? You you think about, let's say, the end of the the end of the Roman Empire, or the end of the feudal system. It's a, when, it is, when the system, the dominant system, is hitting limits. For example, tr trifle things like destroying the planet, creating more social inequality. Uh, then people start looking for solutions. And they start looking at solutions both at the grassroots level and at the level of the man managerial classes, right? So for example, if you're a clever uh, slave owner at the end of the Roman Empire, and there's no more expansion, so you can't get slaves anymore, and it's not economic to, to breed them, then what do you do? Well, you actually free your, free your slaves, and they become serfs. Uh, at the same time, because there's no more gold coming in, the free farmers at the, Ro at the end of the Roman Empire have to pay too much taxes, they go bankrupt, and they go knock on the door of these same lords and say, can I come in? So yeah, both grassroots and managerially, you have looking for solutions and new patterns. And so this is a paradox that it's actually the people from the old system who are feeding the transition, because they have to. So today I would say we have this netarchical capital, which is a, it's a very interesting form of capital because it no longer produces anything, right? Airbnb does not produce hospitality rooms. It allows us to exchange and sell and rent. Uber does not build cars or, ta or taxis. They allow ride hailing to, you know, between self-declared drivers and, and users. Uh, Google does not produce documents. And of course, they are funding this, right? Uber is massively funding an expansion of ride-hailing. Airbnb is massively funding the capacity to rent our extra spaces. But it comes at a cost, right? It comes at a cost of high extraction and a insufficient reinvestment in the production. So if you think about neoliberalism that way, in the 1980s, until the 1980s, there was a social contract that said, you know, if you, uh, if, you do m if you become more productive, you get higher wages, right? And this was stopped 
in the nine, in 1980s. Uh, so today all the money goes up um, and basically wages of workers have become, have become stagnant more or less in the last 20, 30 years. Um, I see the sharing economy as a hyper a version of this. And it's a problem for everyone because if you are making something and more and more people are creating use value themselves, are sharing and renting things they already have themselves. And if the value doesn't stream back, who is going to buy our stuff, right? So I think this is not just a problem for the people who become precarious, it's actually also a systemic problem for our societies. And this has happened over history, so there's a new mode of value creation that doesn't fit in the logic of the dominant system. And it's creating more and more problems. Which then has another effect, which is that the people at the grassroots level who are trying to create new, new forms of living, trying to solve these issues, have to find ways to escape this extraction. And that's what we're working on. So can we still build contributory systems but actually creating thriving livelihoods and businesses around it. Um, but you know, you're entirely right, this is a paradox. Uh, so Facebook is funding 1.5 billion people to do peer-to-peer -peer communication and has enabled 4 million Syrians to use secret Facebook groups to organize their migration. Uh, so this is the paradox of Facebook. It's a private company actively funding subversive uh, human activities that actually undermine, you know, the same systems they're operating in. I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> Yes, it's a, I don't know if I have a solution particularly for this. Um, um, so there was a conference about last month in the US called Platform Corporativism, right? So the idea is that, for example, if, lo if Uber comes into your local space, it's the same as a big uh, grocery uh, chain. 30% of your local value goes out of, the, of your region. And so the idea of platform co-ops is to create um, cooperative models. So connect Uber drivers with users, because it's a good thing, right? Ride hailing is a good thing. It's not a bad thing, it's a good thing by itself. Of course, you know, you need to find a way to, to make it work with the taxi drives, and uh, you know, there's issues there. But in essence, ride hailing, you know, lowers the thermodynamic cost of mobility, and that's really a good thing. But why not create local co-ops? And it's actually happening. Uber drivers are now creating apps themselves, and taxi drivers are creating apps themselves. But the, we have a problem in, the, in, these, in this other economy, which is scaling. And capitalism is very good at scaling. And one of the answers is, one of the, one of the answers would be, and this, is, this was this morning, is that the cooperative movement you know, which already employs more people than all the multinationals combined, 20% more people. Where are they? They're asleep. <laughs> They're asleep on the wheel. So this is, this is my message to them. Like, you know, you have 200 years of experience in building democratic enterprise. It works. But where are you in this space? And to be honest, they're nowhere. 
So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is, you know, the way I talk to government people is I propose that the city could be a convener to create ecosystemic effects in this new entrepreneurial economy. And particularly, I talk about sustainability empowerment platforms. So in Melbourne, you have the Open Food Network, which creates an ecosystem for all the people that are producing non-toxic food. Uh, it's called the Food Resilience Network in Christchurch. Uh, you have, uh, take the example of Germany, instead of six electricity providers, we now have two million electricity providers. So consumer co-ops, consumer-owned renewable energy co-ops have taken over largely 60% the production of electricity. Um, th this was made possible in Germany by policy, by, you know, by the feed-in tariff, right? This is why it happened. People wanted to do it, but they couldn't do it because it wasn't economical. Um, because utilities get 10 times more subsidies than renewable energy, and toxic agriculture gets 10 times more subsidy than renewable, than uh, eco-agriculture. Eco um, so I think the city as convener, you could create platforms like food, energy, mobility, that would convene all the players producing non-toxic food, distributed energy, you know, mobility, forms of mobility, right? And seeing these as common goods for all citizens and support entrepreneurial activity, create multi-stakeholder platforms, and, ba and create incubators. So you probably remember what I showed in the beginning. If you create a co-op, a tech co-op, you have nine times more chance to survive in three years than if you do a startup. You don't learn that in business school, right? They just don't talk about this. Um, but the problem is, if you're young and you're open source, you, you don't get any assistance in creating these other forms. There are no incubators that tell you that there's something else you could do. And this, for me, is the role of the government, is to create incubators, you know, not necessarily promote one over the other, but at least show to young entrepreneurs that there is a choice, that there are different kinds of business models that are available and that the venture winner-take-all model is not the only one that is out there. There are other models that are actually healthy and good for you. So I have, don't have a straight answer for the academics, but maybe the university should do it. Why not create a university co-op for academic publishing? They have the money. They have the academics. Uh, it's, you know, it's a question of taking the initiative. But that's what they're doing now, right? That is exactly what they're doing now, right? Yeah. Well, what we now have is open access publishing, but the, but the problem is if it's still done through these extractive models, they now require academics to pay to be published, which you know maybe it's not a problem in Australia, but if you're an Indian or, an or a Thai or an African academic, you cannot afford to pay to be published in these open access journals. So, yeah. Yes, and, and people are doing it, right? Open access publishing is actually growing very fast, but it's, it doesn't really have, at this moment, I think, a, a sufficiently good business model.
Well, I, I would see the alternative myself in a multi-stakeholder cooperative model that would include the authors, the universities, cooperative publishers, and to create a generative stream of value that is fair for all the parties involved. That would be a generative business model. Uh, how it would work in practice, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert in this particular field, so I, c I can tell you, but I don't think it's impossible to do. Um, Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure this will, this will evolve because you know, the, the, the big mistake has always been um, that these open systems would create a disintermediated world, right? And we know this is not the case. We have the Googles, the Facebooks. Actually, we have pretty monopolistic new intermediaries that have replaced the old ones. Um, so... Um, I think we need we will we need to evolve these these intermediary functions. You know, like we used to have librarians. Um, now I used to be a librarian actually, and I just just a little personal thing. So we share very nice um, very nice conference for people in the sharing economy, young entrepreneurs, five thousand people, amazing conferences, and then they dump everything on YouTube. And it just says panel one, panel two. It's absolutely unusable, right? Exactly. So if, if they would just have a little investment in a cyberarian, right, that would just tag these videos. And that's what I do. That is my job at the P2P Foundation. You know, you see, for example, we're Art Brock on transitioning to the new economy, da, da, da. This is me. I'm taking a video which has absolutely no information. I look up who, who's speaking and what about. And just that makes it, I have 30 million views. Uh, and that's an intermediary role. So it's not about non-intermediation. It's actually about finding the right forms of intermediation between these communities and users who are not you know, involved in this particular thing. And that will take time. We have to build the whole ecosystem around this and that's not there yet. I think after you one more and then we need to go, right? Yeah, sorry. Very good question. Uh, for example, if you look at um, China, China has an amazingly strong Shanzai culture. You know about it, right? Shanzai is open source without the ethics and the legality. So it's using the same advantages where they reverse engineer and then they share it in an entrepreneurial commons and then every entrepreneur adds to it. And the, But as soon as they grow, then they say, oh, okay, I, I go back to the old model. So they just use it in a very instrumental way. But it's actually the basis of their competitivity in electronics. 40% uh, of the mobile phones in the world are Shanzai phones, right? So it is happening in different cultures, different ways, depending on the mentality. And I would say a general thing is that pre-middle class uh, populations are very collaborative, you know, but it's ruled by custom most of the time, right? 
And the problem is when you get out of this, you move to the middle class, competitive, it's mine culture. And it takes a while before the children of this middle class say, I want more. You know, I want a meaningful job. I want to do something about sustainability. I want to do something about... Uh, and these are the people f f uh, f uh, doing this, what I'm talking about, right? Um, so is, so the, the, I live in Thailand, so I, I, I live this every day, is that the poor are very generous and very generative in their practices. And then the middle class, you know, I better watch my wallet. Because uh, they're very extractive in their mentality. And they want to get there. They want to have their fridge and their TV and their car. And they start fighting about the shadow of the neighbor street. Um, I wish it wasn't necessary to pass through this stage, but I haven't seen many examples of it. Uh, my idea is that you know these postmodern, postmaterialist cultures could connect with pre-materialistic cultures. This is something I would like to see happening, but I haven't seen it happening on any scale. So I think I don't know if we can get out of this. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes. Okay. I have a specific vision on this, which is uh, normal people in the free software culture don't agree with me, but I'll just give you uh, my my proposal. So we now have copy left culture uh, licenses, right? The opposite of copyright. So you say here is a commons, everybody can use it. What happens is that. If you say that, then big companies can immediately dominate this, this, this economy. So the Linux economy is dominated by huge conglomerates. And this is true, generally speaking. Once you, let's say you have a fab lab, you want to do Wikihouse or Wikispeed. Well, you need to invest in a space. You need machines, 3D printing. You need raw material. I think it then becomes more of a problem. So we propose something called copy fair licenses. A copy fair license says anybody can share the knowledge, but if you want to commercialize it, then you need to reciprocate in the co-construction of our commons. Right? Uh, just to give you an example, the Fair Shares Association, which is a new property form, you can use their, their creative commons, non-commercial license. So everybody can use their knowledge base, but if you want to make money with it, you have to become a member of the association, and then you get the Creative Commons commercial license. So I think that this is justified, to create a membrane around the ethical entrepreneurs, to protect them against predation, right? And then to find the right transitional measures to work with the dominant economy. For example, Inspiral has an innovation I like a lot. It's called capped returns. So they accept investment, and they guarantee 15 times your investment. When you have it, they ceremoniously gift this thing to the commons, and they honor the funder for doing this. So this is a nice way to socialize and culturalize you know, the dominant uh, businesses into this reciprocal arrangement around a commons-based economy. So it's, it's a question of what you do with externalities. And our, in our dominant system, we don't look at externalities. It's not, it's not my concern. I'm my interest, your interest, we're both happy, and we don't look at anything that's around it. Um, as opposed to the idea of a moral economy that actually internalizes externalities. That says, I'm going to do business in such a way that I don't destroy the planet, and I don't uh, you know, popperize the people are actually getting the coffee, growing the coffee, right? It's another vision of the economy, and you have to make decisions whether that you want to work that way. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, but uh, I have another meeting, so I have to rush. Thank you.
think this is mine. That's yours. And the lovely thing is you just need to head out the door into the lake. Yep. <laughs> I have my, my luggage somewhere here. Oh, do you? Thank you.